Father, we just lift up this time in the Word tonight. We ask you to bless this time. Let everything be accomplished that your will to be done during this time in the Word. Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name that every one of us help us to tune into you, to give you our best ear, our full attention, our focus. Lord, that the anointing and the presence of God be so strong <clears throat> that every one of us be captivated to give you our best ear and our full attention that you would anoint our eyes and ears to have eyes and ears of the spirit to be able to see and hear and understand everything that we need to and Lord that you would give us good fertile soil of hearts and minds right now and Lord that you would speak through me your words of life and truth they would not be my words but yours and that they would go out as living seeds of truth sown out into good fertile soil of hearts and minds and lives that are watered by the Spirit of God. And those seeds of truth will take root in every person and, and begin to grow and produce a hundredfold harvest of eternal fruit that remains till Jesus comes. Lord, we ask that your word go out as a light and shine and dispel any darkness or lies of the enemy, any deception, anything that's not of you, just dispel the darkness. Lord, that your word will go out and be the washing of the water of the word, that there'll be a cleansing. It's like I believe it was Jeremiah spoke that your word is a hammer. <clears throat> Let your word go out, Lord, and break down the strongholds and the deception of the enemy that, that would try to set up in people's minds and hearts and lives. Just tear down the strongholds in Jesus' name. Let it go forth and accomplish everything you sent it forth to do as you promised it would. We bless you, Lord, and thank you for the awesome power of your word. And we believe in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm going to actually open with a scripture that's not in here. But we all know that Jesus talks about asking and seeking and knocking. If you could really give me your best ear about this, because I, this is one of the main things I want people to take away from the sermon. But these are three different types of praying. Asking is along the lines of what I refer to like the word of faith type of you stand on the word of God you know the scriptures you know that what God promises you and so you go before the Lord and you ask him and you stand on that promise and you believe and God gives you an answer that's one realm of praying but it requires all prayer requires faith but as we let me say that again as we're in the realm of asking you ask, you know the word of God gives you a promise, you go before the Lord, you ask him, standing on that promise, and you believe and you receive. Jesus said, all who ask will receive. But it doesn't just stop there because not everything is going to be answered in that asking realm, or at least you're not gonna always get the breakthrough there. Then it moves into seeking. The seeking realm has to do with seeking God's presence his face that you want to know him that you want to be in his presence you you want to learn his ways you want to be intimate with the Lord and you begin to really press into him to have a rich powerful prayer life and fellowship with him and Jesus said all who seek will find him and so there's other scriptures that say if you seek the Lord with all your heart You'll find it. So there's this seeking God. And in the seeking, the Holy Spirit will deal with things. He will show you things that, that are not right, that are a hindrance in your walk. And, and you'll begin to confess and repent of those things. And in the seeking realm, there's a real refining that's going to go on in you. And there's going to be an intimacy with God that you find. But that really, to seek God, you really have to press into him and not give up. Because when I first started seeking the Lord, I didn't know how to pray effectively, and I certainly didn't know how to believe God for things. And so it seemed like it was 
frustrating at first, but over the years you learn, and then you grow in your relationship with him. The other realm of prayer has to do with knocking. Now this is kind of what we're dealing with here. Knocking has to do with you're not just pressing in to know the Lord yourself, like a relationship per se, but you're pressing into the heavens being open and the power of God coming down to affect you and others. That's knocking. And the Bible talks about knocking. You knock and it will be opened unto you. That's the heavens opening and God's presence coming down. But knocking is very challenging. There's even a passage where Jesus talked about there was a man that came and knocked on a guy's door asking him for bread and he said, go away. You know, I'm already in bed. All of us are here asleep, but he kept knocking and kept knocking. And finally the guy got irritated and threw his covers off, you know, I'm paraphrasing, shoved his wife out of the way, got up, went and got some bread. I'm sure he just opened the door, got the bread and said, here you go, get out of here, you know. And, and, but it was out of him being persistent. And so that's, that's a parable, of course, I'm paraphrasing. That's a parable of Jesus about being persistent, though, in your knocking. That you're not, and Jesus said that I stand at the door and knock. So the Lord is also in this, that he's wanting to come in among us, but there's a pressing into this. So the asking realm is one thing. We know God's word. We know the promises. We stand on it. We ask and we believe. We receive. The seeking is that relationship. But the knocking is where it's really, it's going to be like last week's sermon, okay, where it talks about the persistent, heartfelt, earnest prayer of the righteous, that you're, you're persistent, it's an earnest, heartfelt prayer, and you stay with it and you keep going after God. Those type of prayers have to do with the knocking, that like Elijah with the, the cloud the size of a man's hand, that you keep on. See, a lot of people, they want to go where God all, they've already got a breakthrough the heavens already open and they want to go and there's nothing wrong with that but you don't find hardly anybody that wants to go underneath a brass heaven and pray it through that's where you got one in a million right there see everybody wants to go where God's moving that's wonderful I do too but but how many people are willing to pay the price to get somewhere where the heavens are brass and really press into God and keep knocking until things open up over that region so I believe that that's what's going on with River of Life is the knocking realm right now. And it has been a challenge. But for us to have a sustained move of God, last week I talked about the heavens opening and I gave a lot of stories and illustrations and things regarding an open heaven. But this, week, this week I'm not only dealing with an open heaven, but I'm also dealing with a sustained move of God over a long period of time. I might have to switch mics. All right, we're dealing with a sustained move of God over a long period of time. All right, so the Moravians, the Moravian community of Hernut in Saxony in 1727, they commenced a round-the-clock prayer watch that continued nonstop for over 100 years. This is in your notes. The Moravian community of Hernet in Saxony in 1727 commenced a round-the-clock prayer watch that continued nonstop for 100 years. By 1791, 65 years after the commencement of that prayer vigil, the small Moravian community had sent 300 missionaries to the ends of the earth. And the Moravian missionaries met Wesley, some of them did, and they were on a train, they met John Wesley, and it had a very profound effect on his life. So the question is, with the Moravians, and they began this 100-year prayer meeting, we go back and we have to ask the question, what was the result of this? I believe that the first great awakening that we had in this nation in the mid-1700s with John Wesley and Edwards and Whitfield and all that played into it, that awakening affected all of America of the time, and it also affected much of England. It was extremely powerful, but I believe it was a direct result of the Moravian prayers. 
So even though God raised up people like Wesley, I don't believe that Wesley and Whitfield and these guys would have seen what they saw had they not reaped the blessings of the answered prayers of the Moravians. And not only that, but the Moravians, it was really a neat story because Wesley and others were very Calvinistic in their views and oh, I'm sorry, Wesley wasn't. He, he was searching actually. He was trying to search, but he was very religious and he didn't know, he didn't have a relationship with the Lord and whenever they were on this boat in particular, this, they, were, they, they were thinking that they were going to sink. I believe it was a boat and they were going to sink, but their life was in danger. Wesley was very scared, and he really didn't know where he was going to spend eternity. But he was a very religious man. He would have considered himself a follower of Christ, but he really didn't have that relationship. And he noticed that the Moravians were at total peace, whether they lived or died. And Wesley was just blown away at the fact that they were so confident in where they would spend eternity. And it had a very profound effect on Wesley. Because the Moravians had a relationship with the Lord. He had a religion in his life. And that resulted in Wesley actually coming to know the Lord. And, and those that have uh, read about Wesley, he, he, his heart began to burn. He began to have a hunger. And him and some others started a group. They called it the Holy Club. It was a group of guys that were called into the ministry, but they were going to begin to pray and seek God with all their heart. And they took communion one day, and, the, and it says that the, the heavens opened. It was just like they described it like a zipper, and the heavens opened and the presence of God came down. And that really, in essence, is where the awakening began was in that small group. And we know Wesley was, as it always is with every move of God, Wesley was not liked during his day. And he was disliked enough to where churches of that time refused to have him preach in their church. Even the church that his father planted and preached at for many years, Wesley was not welcome to preach there. And so he ended up preaching in the streets, but it led to a great revival. But my point in all of that is this. It was the Moravians that prayed that thing through. And that, I believe, right now is exactly where River of Life is and where things are in this nation. I'm speaking to River of Life because it's the church I pastor, but I believe that the emphasis right now the Lord is placing on us and others is prayer. We have not seen things open up yet in the realm of the harvest, but it is a season of prayer and to really see something break forth in prayer. And so last week, I can't recap, but that was the emphasis was on that persistent prayer and, and pressing in to, to see things open up. And it's, it's a sacrificial life. But what I want to talk about here is how do you sustain that? How do you press into that and keep the momentum? Because the Moravians not only prayed, and then their prayers, I believe that, History shows us that their prayers resulted in revival breaking out, but they continued on praying through all those years that the, the first great awakening took place. They didn't stop praying. So once you get the breakthrough, that's not the time to sit back and stop praying. That's the time to say, look, now we need to keep praying that we keep the momentum going. So hi historically, prayer has birthed revival. The Moravian prayer is what birthed the first great awakening. But also we have many examples. Father Nash traveled with Finney. And Frank Bartleman helped birth the Azusa Street Revival. So Father Nash was the intercessor that would go in front of Finney in the second great awakening. And he would go to the city where Finney was going to go next. And he would pray and he would fast. And people reported that they could hear, you know, because he would rent like a, a hotel room, you know. And back then, I'm sure things weren't as insulated as they are now. But anyway, they could hear him in their groaning and travailing and, and crying out to God in desperation. And Father Nash was actually the intercessor that helped to give birth to the move of God that Finney would come into the city, but Father Nash had already prayed the thing in. Are y'all hearing me? So Father Nash was the one that was the forerunner. In the same way, Bartleman, Frank Bartleman would pray and he heard what was going on in Wales, and he was desperate for a move of God, and he began to cry out to God. 
And Frank Bartleman was so hungry and desperate for a move of God that people were worried about him because he wouldn't eat and he was losing weight and and he but he was determined that he was going to pray and fast and seek God for a move because he really felt something was coming to Los Angeles and he kept praying and he kept pressing in and he even printed up some things that that talked about the revival in Wells and he was giving them out to people and he was he was sowing seeds of of, of people uh, like a hunger arising in people for more of God and many believe that Frank Bartleman was the great intercessor that was used to help give birth to the Azusa Street Revival. Also, we know historically that Edward Miller and his group that I've preached on this before was really pressing in and they were desperate for a move of God in Argentina. And him and his group committed to prayer and fasting and repentance, vicarious repentance for Argentina. And they prayed and there was people in the group that were so gripped with the burden that they would lay there for hours at a time and there were so many tears that were shed that and it said that some of them it really did look like a little pool of water next to their head and and he said he didn't think that people could cry that much but it was supernatural and people were crying out for in desperation for a move of God and and God responded in Argentina we see the great Argentine revival many years later and even as I'm preaching this tonight that I promise you that this is something that Satan does not want preached and I can feel it but anyway these are the things that that Pierce, it was like spearheads that pierced through so that revival could come. So historically, we see the Moravians press through in their constant prayer and fasting and seeking God, and an awakening came. Father Nash and others were praying desperately, crying out to God the prayers of a righteous man. And it, it helped to break through the resistance and, and we know that Finney's ministry was very powerful, but it wouldn't have been what it was without the intercessors. Frank Bartleman prayed so earnestly that people still to this day talk about the effects of Bartleman's prayers and the insight that he had. I read some of his writings and the depth of insight that he had in the spirit. You could tell that he was a man of prayer. And he really cried out to God. He was desperate. And it, it helped to break things open for the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles to come forth. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, Edward Miller. But all through history, you can see that there's always been this prayer movement that would precede revival. People were really desperate. They were crying out. They were hungry for a move of God. And there was a burden that gripped them. Even at Brownsville. They said that they had all those banners up, but you would hear the most weeping and wailing, and people, people were um, groaning and travailing around the revival banner. That's where you heard it, because they were desperate for a move of God, and God showed up in an awesome way. <coughs> when it comes to prayer, as I discussed some things last week as well, it does not... I promise you that having big numbers about prayer when it comes to prayer is not the priority. When you start getting big numbers a lot of times, and I, I can give you one story, but I could go on about this. I could really belabor this point, but I don't want to. But I remember one time, and I believe my wife was with me, we had this facility open up for a group of us that I was involved in to do prayer. And all these people came from different churches to this one place. And, it, and I don't want to say much about it because if people hear this, they'll know what I'm talking about. So I'm trying to be vague. But we, rent, we got this place. I wasn't in charge. I mean, there was somebody else that was supposed to be in charge. But somehow it got delegated to somebody that didn't know what they were doing. Okay, but anyway, there was a whole bunch of people from different groups that came in. And we we're all supposed to join together in prayer. It was a mess. Weren't you with me, Sandy? Yeah. It, it was so chaotic everybody just did their own thing there was no unity there was no anointing and somehow the guy that got in charge of running it should have never been in charge of running that it, it was just a mess and so I promise you I promise you that with smaller groups of people that live holy and are in unity you can get much more done in prayer I know that from experience But River of Life, who is desperate enough to help press in for what's coming? 
we know we have a promise in America for revival. Okay, this is something that we know. We know that um, even the prophets of in 1910, um, William Seymour and someone else was prophesying in about a hundred years there'd be a great revival break out and it would be like unto Azusa but greater and all that you guys know the prophecy but and then we know others Dr. Cho said it would begin in Pensacola but eventually it would work its way throughout all of America all of America blazed in the fires of revival Ruth Ward Heflin saw America blaze in Dallas the hub on and on things I quote all the time things that you probably have memorized we know and all those that I respect feel and I feel it are feeling something right now stirring and, and Satan is, is very concerned about it, but there is a revival that is near in America. And I believe that this revival is, it has the potential to really turn into a third great awakening. I do. And so what's the difference? An awakening affects the whole nation. A revival is usually in one location, and it affects everything around that location. People will come to it, etc., but an awakening affects the nation, like Wales. I believe that we have the potential to see a revival that affects the nation. It turns into an awakening. And you never know if this awakening wouldn't turn into what's, what would be known as a reformation, where there's literally a change in society here. But it is going to take people that will press into God that will not only ask because a lot of times that's our own personal issues and not only will they seek God because that's your personal prayer life and you're seeking after him but they're willing to press in and keep knocking and keep knocking and keep knocking and keep interceding and fasting and praying until they get a major breakthrough that not only affects them and their family but it affects a city and a region and possibly a nation We've seen also in our time how Korea, South Korea, has had continual prayer and fasting, hundreds of thousands of people in Prayer Mountain continually praying and fasting, and, and how their prayers have, have caused um, South Korea, like the skies over that region of the, of the world, to be open. And, and because of that, so many people getting saved and so much going on. And I believe that the prayers of um, South Korea, in my opinion, have had a lot to do with why God is sending revival to America. Because they were praying for us when America wasn't praying. They were praying for us, um, and they're the ones, Dr. Cho was the one that prophesied that Pensacola, it would start there in the first place. I believe that God responded to their prayers. And just like last week, I talked about the heavens open, and Jesus said there would be angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. We need that there's prayer places, that there's an open heaven over them, and the angels of the Lord are ascending and descending and going out on assignment throughout the nation. Amen? We need places that know how to get a hold of God, that know how to get into the throne room. They know how to press in and not give up too many people don't know how to pray. This is those that know how to travail and how to get into God's presence and press into him. And how many knows that prayer is what blocks satanic attack and satanic schemes? The plans of the devil will be blocked whenever we pray. But if people refuse to pray and they're going to be lazy, don't be surprised if the devil doesn't have his way sometimes. And it's because of the church not praying. And I also have seen this twice in my ministry, and I've heard of it in other ministries. But twice in my ministry, we have to be willing as leaders to deal with things that need to be dealt with. I promise you, if you're the type that is passive and will just wink at things and let things go on that shouldn't go on, I promise you that God will pass that by and go somewhere that won't do that. There's twice I've had to deal with things. It was hard to deal with it, and I was really persecuted. And to this day, there's people that don't like me because of it. But both times when I dealt with it, the presence of God increased 
substantially, and there's people in this room that will verify that. I had a friend of mine in uh, Greenville, Texas, actually, that was a pastor at one time of this church, and he, just to verify this has happened in other places, but he said that there was a group of people that continually caused problems in that church. They were always gossiping, always causing people to be upset with each other, and he, he had had a belly full. He went to them and talked to them. He took leaders. He did everything scripturally and biblically, and he finally just had a belly full of it, and he wrote him a letter and let them know that him and the board had met and that they were no longer members of this church. And he was praying for them because he was concerned about where they're going to spend eternity, you know. Anyway, they left, and he said after that, they had done nothing different. There wasn't any more prayer than there was before. There wasn't anything else going on than what was before. But he said, man, after those people left, he said something broke loose in that church, and they started seeing an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and a revival that lasted a really long time. So prayer is what purges the skies. It opens the heavens overhead. Prayer is what brings the presence of God into a place. And whenever you're dealing with the realms of prayer and the presence of God coming in, the presence of God is what makes all the difference. That's what made the difference on the day of Pentecost. There was a story recorded at the Brownsville Revival of an alcoholic heathen that was brought to church on a Tuesday night. And they had their prayer meeting going on, and around 1,500 people were there gathered to pray. That's all they were doing was praying. There was no preaching. There was no testimony. There was nothing like that. There was nothing of the Word of God. There was only prayer only. But the heavens opened, and the presence of God was so strong there that this alcoholic heathen had come to the prayer meeting, and the presence of God came upon him. He got convicted. Nobody preached to him. Nobody talked to him. He gave his life to Christ and left her totally transformed. That's happened over and over and over. Why? Because the presence of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people to Christ. That's why it says no man can come to Christ unless the Father draw him. The Father draws him by the Spirit of God. That's how the Father draws. And so we know the Spirit of God is the one that's going to bring people to Christ. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul talked about there's people that plant, people that water, and people that reap. I know you guys know this, but God is the one that brings the increase. The truth is that it's the prayer that is what is sowing into the heavens. It's the prayer that is reaped, that, that reaps the harvest. In fact, the Bible says if we sow in tears, we reap with joy. And there's got to be that sowing in tears, and that's a reference to um, intercession. Acts 2.37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and others, brothers, what shall we do? Listen, it's prayer that brings the presence of God. And when the presence of God comes, the presence of God, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is what convicts people and brings people to the Lord. So in other words, you know, we're going out witnessing and we're seeing some people saved. But whenever we really get a breakthrough here, like we're going to one day, there's going to be a move of God that it's going to be a lot easier to see more people saved than we could have ever imagined. But it's the Spirit of God that does it. Just like when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, they were already cut to the heart and said, Brothers, what shall we do? It was the Spirit of God that convicted them. It wasn't Peter's great sermon. In 2 Corinthians 7.10, it says, Godly sorrow brings repentance. In John 16, 8, and when the Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin. So there's a move of God that has to come and bring in the harvest. But it won't come without prayer. Powerful signs and wonders to confirm the gospel. In Acts 4, 29, and now, Lord, take note of their threats. We prayed that today. And enable, grant your bond servants that we may speak your word with boldness or confidence and extend your hand to heal. And signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had pr prayed that, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. That's what happens with places that pray. Places that pray and press into God, there is a move of God that will come in and shake things and release a boldness. 
So here's what I wanted to get to tonight, here in a moment. There's been a wrestling that has been unbelievable in this region. But there's got to be people that are willing to press through it. And I believe that God has allowed there to be a group here at River of Life that's willing to pray and seek God and press in. But the, the resistance has been very strong. So let's learn from some of the past failures real quick of revivals that have died. Number one, Wells. The great Welsh revival, Evan Roberts saw a great move of God there. Tremendous. But the move of God died in Wales. And we have to ask, what happens? Evan Roberts, who was so powerfully touched by God, tremendous anointing on his life, but yet he began to deal with depression. And I'm going to tell you something. Where there's a, a heavy attack of a Jezebel spirit and Jezebel and Ahab, that stuff is serious. And let me tell you, that will begin, if somebody allows it, it can settle over and it can kill a move of God. And it can bring depression and suppress things. And that's exactly when you look at the life of Elijah, that's exactly what happened to Elijah. He went into the desert and he went underneath a tree and he wanted to die. It was depression, serious depression, suicidal depression. And then Elijah finds himself in a cave whining and complaining to God over and over, never got over it. No matter the fact that God sent him an angel, no matter the fact that God gave him supernatural food and all that God did for him, he, he split the rocks, the fire came, the earth, but remember all this? Nothing really ever got Elijah out of that depression. And finally, God found, uh, told Elijah, said, look, go back the way you came, and you're going to have to anoint Hazael, you're going to have to anoint Elisha to succeed you as prophet, and you're going to have to anoint Jehu. And they're going to basically do what you were originally called to do, but I can't get you out of this depression, so I'm taking you home. And that's what happened with Evan Roberts. The revival was tremendous. It was so powerful. And it, it, and it was affecting the whole nation of Wales. And people beyond Wales were coming in and getting touched. And in the midst of that revival, Evan Roberts began to deal severely with depression. And Satan had sent in a woman. It happened to be Jesse Penn Lewis and, and her husband. They had an estate. They were very wealthy. But anyway, he ended up living with them, and it, his ministry died. This great man of God that was so young and so anointed and so powerful with God, his ministry died, and you never even hear anything out of the guy from that point. He came back to Wells years later to preach. I believe it was at his father's funeral, but he came back to preach in Wells many years later, and the people were there, and as he preached, they, they reported they felt electricity in the atmosphere, and they felt electricity shooting through them, and they asked amongst themselves, could revival break out again? But then he went back, right back to England to that estate and, and seclusion. That's why I keep saying here recently that the Lord has put on my heart that our homes have to be in order, that there has to be unity, and there has to be this proper honor and respect because if those things are missing, then you can give place for, for a Jezebel spirit and an Ahab type thing to come in, and it will be a serious attack. Let me say that again. That's why things have got to be in order. There's got to be unity. And there's got to be proper honor and respect that's shown. Where there's dishonor and disrespect, that's rebellious. Amen? Where there's division or things are out of order, that can, that can be connected to rebellion and witchcraft control. The next revival that died out was the Sousa Street Revival. Tremendous move of God. Powerful. The, the, but the two mistakes that Azusa made... I'm going to go out of order from what I wrote, but the first one was that they allowed some mixture. I mean, but when I say that, 99% of everything going on in Sousa was a major move of God, okay? But William Seymour did not know for sure about some of the things going on, but you've got to understand, Pentecost had not taken place. This was where God restored Pentecost. 
So they were seeing things that they hadn't seen before, and, and Seymour had never read about except for in the scriptures, but read, he didn't have a history of Christian revivals to look back necessarily. He didn't know, even though there probably was some things about Wesley, but he didn't know what, was, what to do. So he asked his spiritual father to come and to help sort out is everything going on here of God. And, and there had been some weirdos that Satan had sown in there that were kind of new agey. And, but the spiritual father made the mistake of just wanting to shut the revival down and kill the whole thing. And William Seymour said, well, we're not having that. And so they, I, nobody knows what all was said, but I'm sure that it was, you know, one of those meetings, you know. Anyway, and so he was, the spiritual father was padlocked out, thrown out. But Seymour and them, they, they didn't want to quench the spirit of God. They didn't want to hinder what God was doing. But there was some stuff that started to come in that was a little weird, and they didn't know how to handle it. And the second big mistake that Azusa made, and this was the real big one, was they began to try to make it into a denomination. And Frank Bartleman said that, you know, they put up on, you can see it, the picture this day, they put up on the mission there, Apostolic Faith Mission, this big sign. And Bartleman said whenever he saw that sign, he felt right then in his spirit, the end has begun. You know, it's over now. You can't control the move of God. You can't make it into a denomination. You can't try to control everything. When you start trying to do that and take ownership of it, it's going to die. So we have to learn from Azusa Street to, if there's things that, that are questionable in the spirit, we do need to address that and deal with that. But we also cannot control the move of God. Cane Ridge, I'm trying to extend a lot of grace and mercy because these guys, they didn't know what to do. None. I mean, Seymour was doing the best that he knew how to do. Probably one of the most sincere, humble Christians that's lived in the last couple hundred years. But he didn't know what to do about some of these things, some of the mixture that was trying to creep in. Cane Ridge, think about it. You have this open field of tens of thousands of people back in a day when you didn't have a PA system. You had no way of dealing with the masses that were there. They were in an open field, and people would come with their wagons. There was tens of thousands of people in this field to the degree the U.S. sent military troops to keep an eye on everything, just to make sure that there wasn't any rioting or whatever. There had to be preachers scattered throughout the field, standing on things like tree stumps, preaching so that people could just hear the Word of God. But what happened was that they took communion, the heavens opened, the power of God exploded there in Cane Ridge, and it was so intense. And people were falling, people were shaking, people were all kinds of Holy Spirit manifestations that were going on just like they, they go on today. These things were breaking forth. But the problem was, was that some of the manifestations were, you know, out of their own human emotion. Like, for example, they had a couple people that would run around barking like dogs or whatever. Okay. But it was such a, so many tens of thousands of people, preachers scattered out just trying to preach. That, I mean, how in the world are you going to try to contain or deal with those type of issues? Not in a controlling way, but just in a managing, in a pastoring way, you see? So the Cane Ridge Revival, I believe it was what it was, and I think that it was something that, that really hit the mark and reached its potential. But nonetheless, it did die out. But there wasn't any way for those people to properly pastor that thing. You have to understand, a revival cannot be controlled, but it does have to be pastored. And there's a difference. The pastoring adds some kind of framework to it that keeps things where they need to be. And when things start getting weird, you can deal with them. They didn't have that at Cane Ridge. And so the move of God over time died because it didn't have the structure and it didn't have the leadership. The Hebridean revival. And we've studied all of these here in River of Life, so you guys should know what I'm talking about over the last year or two. Um, Brother Zach has been teaching on these, remember? All right, the Hebridean revival. The power of God comes down as a result of them praying and seeking God with all their heart. As the revival came down, people were getting saved in mass all over the island. The whole island was affected by the power of God. Duncan Campbell comes in. He's preaching. He's ministering. He's doing everything he knows to do. And people were getting saved by the thousands and being brought into church. It affected everywhere. But the thing was that... 
even though the move of God was there, and even though it had no, there was an evangelist, Duncan Campbell, there preaching, the churches had not prepared themselves like a, a wine skin that could handle the new wine. They hadn't prepared themselves for revival. And so there was no proper wineskin to handle the move of God in any church throughout all of Hebrides. And so therefore, they didn't have any place to sustain the move of God. And the revival died. So we see here that Satan tries to attack these revivals with whales, with this oppression, this depression, this Jezebel type spirit trying to bring depression on the leadership and cause somebody like an Elijah to go in isolation and be depressed and kill the move of God. You see at Azusa, they tried to get to where they controlled instead of just pastoring it, but controlling it, making it a denom denomination. At Cane Ridge, they had no structure and no leadership. In Hebrides, there was no place that could be like a wineskin that could handle the move of God. So we need to think about these things. As we're about to see a major move of God in America, people need to go back and look at this history and say, look, what can I do different to help sustain the move of God? How can I be alert and ready to not come under and be buckled underneath a Jezebel spirit's attack? How can I position myself to where I can use the wisdom that's needed to not try to make it into a denomination or try to control everything, but just pastor it? How can we get structure in place and have leadership in place? And how can our churches be a wineskin that can really sustain the move of God? Some other mistakes that have been made in revival history is revival has died with some of its leaders. There should have been people that were prepared to take up the move of God and run with the fire after the leader died. Would anybody argue that point? Is it God's will that revival die with a leader? I don't believe so. But somebody needed to be like an Elisha that could take up the mantle of their Elijah and run with the fire. And you know, biblically, Elisha saw double. There's no reason why there shouldn't be these moves of God being continually sustained. I realize that the intensity of, of I mean, full-on revival is so intense that I understand that that level of intensity probably would not necessarily be sustained 24-7 for from now on. I understand that. But there can be Book of Acts Christianity. There can be such a move of God to where... There's an intensity that happens, and then God may allow things to relax a little bit to give people a break, but then it'll build the fire, build back up, and there can be this ebb and flow like a river where we're continually moving with God. Would everybody agree with that? You know, God's not wanting things to die. That's the point. He doesn't want a move of God, and then you look 10 years later, and, it, and it's so dead and dry there. It's like the devil went over there and just threw cold water on that fire. That's not the will of God. Another major mistake has been that evil men and evil women have been allowed in and given influence. You have to be careful about who you allow in places of influence. And even at Brownsville, they admitted that things happened so much quicker and bigger than what they had anticipated that they didn't have discipleship in place, especially for all the new converts. So we need to be thinking about now discipleship and how to handle all these new converts that are going to be coming to the Lord. And the last thing is weariness of the saints, where people just get tired. You know, there needs to be a changing of the guard, so to speak, where maybe one group that's ministering one night can take a break, another minister another night. But, you know, you start going six days a week, and you're going to all hours of the night, and people are working jobs, it can be weary. So you need to think about these things, because that you don't want people to get worn out where they can't function. They start having health issues, okay? We've got to, and there was people even back in the 40s and 50s, the great tent meetings and revivals that, that reported that some of the leaders dealt with some health issues because they just kept going and going and going. You know, God has called us to have a Sabbath rest. That's a biblical principle. The next point is obedience is the key to an open heaven. Matthew 24, 28. It says, wherever there's a corpse, the vultures will gather. So Satan's kingdom traffics where it's dead spiritually, where it's dry spiritually, and where there's darkness spiritually. Let me say that again. 
Satan's kingdom traffics where it's dead spiritually, it's dry spiritually, and it's dark spiritually. So we have to, as I mentioned earlier, we've got to have lives that are lined up with the scriptures and things are right because whenever our lives are right with God and we're obedient to his word, there should be a continual open heaven over our lives. But whenever we start getting in sin and allowing things in our lives that we should not allow in our lives, things can really begin to be hindered in the heavenlies. It's like a brass heaven can come overhead. So number one, as I mentioned earlier, we have to call out and be willing to deal with sin. Number two, we have to be willing to put things in order. Things have got to be in order, and they've got to be unified. And I already touched on some of this earlier in the sermon, but just that, you know, if you're going to be the type that does this, there's going to be people that don't like you. So if you're the type of person that just can't stand the fact that there's somebody out there that doesn't like you, you don't need to get into the ministry. Ten scriptural warnings of revival. We need to pray for great wisdom and grace in these areas. Number one, God brought Paul and Barnabas together. We know that the story, they were, they were there praying and fasting, and the Holy Spirit has said about Paul and Barnabas for the call to which I called them, and they laid hands on them, they sent them out. They were great, you know, apostles and missionaries. But later on in Acts 15, we read to where they got into a big fight. And Paul and Barnabas parted ways over a fight. That wasn't God. And so I'm going to tell you the first warning about revival when you start seeing a move of God is, number one, you've got to guard against and protect division and make sure that no division is coming in. Because Satan tries to divide up God-ordained relationships. Because God brought Paul and Barnabas together, and you never read anywhere in the scriptures where it said God tore that relationship apart. He didn't. It was a fight they had between the two of them. The next warning in revival is religious spirits. There's going to be religious spirits that are out there that get stirred up. They get very agitated. When they see revival, they see the move of God, and they begin to really persecute the move of the Holy Spirit, they cannot stand it. A religious spirit cannot stand a move of God. They can't stand the freedom. They can't stand that, that people are dancing and they're free, you know, in the church service. They can't stand the emotionalism that people are crying or they're laughing. They just can't stand the move of the Spirit of God and the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. So there's going to be persecution from the religious community, and you're just going to have to deal with that head on uh, with boldness. There's just no way around that. The next warning as great revival comes, you know, um, Israel was struggling, but when King David came to power, David subdued all the enemies of Israel. So it was nothing short of a revival of that time and that the nation, all their enemies were subdued and David brought them into a very good place spiritually. How did Satan counter move that move of God? Was he stirred up David to commit adultery with Bathsheba and have her husband murdered. So, in the midst of revival, as God begins to move, don't think that just because God's touching you that you're still not flesh and blood. And don't think that now, all of a sudden, you cannot fall into sin. Okay, you're going to have to guard your eyes, guard your mind, and get, you know, harness your passions and such, and keep yourself holy unto God. And stay humble. Falls come because of pride. We start thinking that we got it all together. Now let me tell you something about prayer as well. When you look in the life of Abraham, God spoke to Abraham. He was around 75 years old and told him, I'm going to make you a father of nations, okay? Abraham had the promise of God. He knew if I'm going to be the father of nations, that means I'm going to at least have to have a son. And so he had the promise of God and he went in faith, but it was 25 years later before God gave him a son. Now, how many of you know that some of you guys in here aren't even 25 years old? 25 years is a long time. 
25 years is a long time to have heard from God and not see something happen. And all the while, while they're waiting, their bodies are getting less and less in a condition to be able to have children in the first place. So it looked like things were losing hope over time. And here's the problem. Sarah came up with the idea and brought it to Abraham. But hey, why don't you um, have sex with the, my servant here and then we'll have a child that way through adoption. But that was not God's plan. Here's what a lot of people do. Whenever they're praying about something, they don't want to wait for God to come through. They want to take matters in their own hand at some point. What, no matter what it is, whether, whether it has to do with relationships or health or whatever their financial thing, whatever they're believing God for, instead of praying about it and letting God move over time, maybe God's got to do something in you. Maybe God's got to do something in somebody else. Maybe God's, you know, we don't know even a small percent of what's actually going on out there, but we're praying and believing and not seeing something yet. And there's a subtle pride there that begins to get frustrated and say, well, I guess God isn't going to come through for me. You know, I, I, I guess he does it for other people, not for me. People don't realize, and I say this in love, how really arrogant that is. Because that is calling God a liar. God said he would do it for you. Don't go around saying that he's not who he says he is. He is faithful. But there's this subtle pride there that says, well, God's not going to do it for me. God's not going to come through. I guess God hears other people's prayers and not mine, and, and I need to take matters into my own hands now. And then they begin, the person begins to do things themselves to make it happen. How I many knows that's exactly how an Ishmael got born in Abraham's household? Because Abraham took things in his own hands and tried to fix it for God. God, you're taking too long. I'm not sure that you can really do this or not. I don't know. So we're just going to take matters into our own hand. And, that, and it really was regretted. And people, instead of submitting to the process of God, saying, Lord, I'm asking you to do it, whether, whether it's financial, whether it's relational, whether it's health-based, whatever it is that I'm praying you know, about here, I'm going to submit it into your hands, I believe, and I'm going to stay in faith until I see the promise fulfilled. But on that process, at some point, they give up faith and they begin to say, well, you know, I think that I'll fix this myself. And then they start fixing it themselves. And even though they may end up with something good, it's a really good possibility. It's not God. And in the long run of their life, eventually that decision will be regretted. Press into God. You know what? It takes humility to press into God. It takes humility to say, God, I don't understand everything, but I trust you. It takes humility to say, you know what? I may not be getting what I want right now the way I want it, but I trust you, Lord, and I'm going to stay with you, and I, and I know that you're at work. I may not see it all right now, but I know that you hear my prayers, and I know that you're at work on my behalf. And I'm thankful for what you're doing. You are faithful. That's humility. But pride says, nah, God's not doing it. See, do you see the difference? It's very subtle. A lot of people don't realize that some of the things they deal with is actually rooted in pride within themselves. They don't realize that because it's so subtle. Here's some other things that go back to warnings and revival. Idolatry. God had brought the children of Israel out through the Red Sea. The waters parted. A great revival with signs and wonders following. No doubt about it. But right as Israel gets out into the wilderness, what do you read about? They're dancing around a, a golden, you know the thing was the ugliest cow you've ever seen in your life, that they made it in the wilderness by hand. Aaron, who's no, you know, he had no formal training. It probably was barely recognizable as a cow. And they're dancing around it naked. They're doing these, these what they learned in Egypt idolatry. Right in the midst of God moving so powerful, idolatry and deception. 
How is it that people could see a sea part and see a, a nation brought to its knees and then be so deceived just a few days later that they're worshiping another God? Don't think that you and I are above deception. It is the grace of God. That's why we've got to be so humble and stay close to Jesus. Deception is powerful and it's serious. And we don't want to get deceived and begin to get off into some different idols or something that's not God. The next thing is rebellion. Again, Israel was moving forward toward the promised land. And what happened? Satan stirred up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and they began to rebel against Moses. Has God only anointed Moses? Has God only called Moses? Who does Moses think he is? And they began to rebel against the leadership. And we know how God felt about that because God caused the earth to open underneath them like a sinkhole and suck them straight down to hell. All of them. And think about that. Their families, too. And even their animals, their donkeys. And what did their donkey do? You know, it's like everything got sucked down in this. But see, rebellion is serious. And God had to kill that rebellion right there. Listen, re rebellion is something that whenever you're in the midst of revival, you've got to watch that there's not going to be people that are wanting to do their own thing their own way. I mean, knows that God's not going to operate through rebellion. I remember even just to give one story off the top of my head um, we had went to a conference and I, I know that Pastor Stephen will remember this and maybe some others were with us I don't remember who all was there at the time but we went to a conference in Florida and it was a youth it was a really powerful thing and but there was there was somebody there that was praying for people and he wasn't supposed to be remember that some of you guys remember he's going through praying for people and um, that's rebellion and God's not going to operate through rebellion he's not going to bless rebellion Okay, there's got to be um, a coming under authority and do what we're told. And I remember that, that that really bothered me because here's somebody that is specifically told to them, only those that have badges are to pray with people, and he's just going around praying for people anyway. The next one is witchcraft control and depression, which I've already talked enough about to not dwell on it. But don't allow anything to bring an oppressive control. People want to control the move of God. That is the... the great warfare of revival is whether or not it's going to be under God's control or man's control. That is really the battleground right there. I mean, yes, you deal with the demonic realm and the spiritual warfare. That's always going to, but really whether the revival is going to live or die has a lot to do with whether they're going to let God be God or man is going to try to control it. And evil men slipping in. Um, Sambat and Tobiah, Sambalat and Tobiah, they were persecuting. The whole time Nehemiah was working and building the walls, they were persecuting and mocking and ridiculing and resisting. And they, they, they sent letters back to the king to try to, to send uh, troops there to kill the Jews. And there was constant, you know, Nehemiah leaves and comes back. And after they had finished the walls and the temple was already built and things were, were good, and, and Nehemiah comes back and finds that some goofy priest had allowed Tobiah, one of the very people that had fought them the whole time, tooth and nail. The, you can understand Nehemiah was probably riding his horse going back and forth through the whole walls of the city, you know, encouraging the men, keep building, and he's listening to Sambat, Sambat and Tobiah's ugly voices just ringing out, mocking them the whole time. And Nehemiah leaves out, comes back from being out of town, and some goofy priest had given Tobiah a room in the temple to live there like a little apartment. So Nehemiah loses his temper. He goes in there, kicks the door down, literally throws the guy out, throws all of his stuff out, says, get out of here and don't come back. Listen, you've got to be careful to not let evil men that persecuted things to slip in. Amen? Another one is betrayal. Gedalia. Jeremiah chapter 40. He was the governor. He was the leader. And somebody had warned him. They said, listen, there's an assassination attempt coming your way. And he said, I'll be all right. And then you read he's dead shortly after that. So here's the thing. You've got to learn to take the warning seriously. There's a lot of, of ministers out there that don't take some of the warnings from their intercessors as serious as they should. Okay? And I, whenever my intercessors come, they've had a dream or, or some revelation. I take that serious. And we pray about it. And I've seen over and over 
where the dreams and visions that they've had have come to pass exactly the way that they were. And these were warnings that we could pray about. Another one is man worship. As soon as Gideon saw a great, great move of God. I mean, remember Gideon's men, 300 men, destroyed hundreds of thousands of men. They fled. It was the, the shofar blast, that whole story. Well, right after that, Gideon allows the people to make an ephod after him, and they all went whoring after that, worshiping this idol that was made. Look, just because God begins to move, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus and don't let any person or anything become an idol. Even revival itself can become an idol. Even praise and worship can be an idol. Everything has got to go back to him. And that's one of the things that I always encourage people when I pray for people, when someone gets healed or delivered of things, I try to encourage them, listen, it's Jesus that did that. And as this revival really breaks forth, I want to have when testimonies are given like that and somebody got healed, physically healed, I want to give them the opportunity that they thank Jesus for is a lot of times they tend to point out the person that prayed for them. You know, okay, but they didn't heal you, Jesus did. So we gotta get all back to him and, that, and prevent any of that type of idolatry going on. And the last warning is greed and the love of money. Gehazi was Elisha's servant, and Gehazi, uh, remember Naaman the leopard, he dipped in the Jordan, he was healed. He wanted to give Elisha some money. Elisha said, I don't want your money. Just go back home, be thankful that you were healed, okay? And as the guy was leaving, Gehazi ran after him and said, oh, Elisha changed his mind, and he wanted the money. And so Naaman gave him the money, but whenever he came back, um, Elisha told him, said, because you did this, it was a greedy thing, and you took money, and you shouldn't have took it. He said, now the leprosy that was on, Na on Naaman is going to cling to you, and Gehazi became leprous. And you don't read about him anymore. You know what's sad about that? If the guy hadn't have had a money issue, see, the, the mantle went from Elijah to Elisha and doubled. What could have happened from Elisha to Gehazi? We'll never know. But the mantle went into Elisha's grave. That's why years later, some, I believe his Moabite raiders came and they threw a guy into a tomb. A dead man hit Elisha's bones. Remember that story? And he came back to life. You know why? Because that mantle was still with Elisha in the tomb. So it's sad. It's a sad story because what would have happened if Gehazi didn't have a love of money issue? He could have inherited even more than Elisha. And I'm going to close out with an atmosphere shift that's coming. But I just ask people to pray because I feel in our nation right now there's just a raging in the heavens. There's warfare that's going on in the spirit realm. And I have felt lately for the last little while, my wife and I have talked, I've really felt some resistance, um, especially before church and during worship. And I promise you, friend, that there's a lot going on right now. The devil does not want people praying, and he doesn't want people pressing into a move of God right now because it's coming. And he wants the church to just go to sleep and, and not let it happen. But if we'll press into God, we're going to have what we're praying for. All right. So let me close with an atmosphere shift. I believe that God is, is really doing something. I believe that in the past, there was a time when there was an emphasis on inner healing and deliverance with this core group. When we get new people, they come to us, we pray with them. But as far as the core group, the inner healing and deliverance has, has been prayed about. And by and large, most of that has been accomplished. It's been broke through. Not, not all of it, but most of it. And then earlier this year, there was a tremendous amount of deep consecration unto God. And the prayer, the fasting, you guys remember what we did, you know, around Passover, it was really powerful. Uh, we had a water baptismal service. Many people wanted to get baptized again and, and just consecrate their lives. And people told me after Passover and also after the water baptism, they really felt different. Like God had done something. There was a deep consecration. And I believe that the defilement was removed. Like there was defilement that was still resonant, but God purged that out. So first it was the deliverance from like curses and spirits and things like that. Then it was defilement. 
But here's what I feel like God is about to do. Now the Lord is wanting to shift atmospheres in people's lives. And see, if you and I were to take this building and somehow we could seal it off completely where there was no way that, that any type of water could get out of it, it was totally sealed off. Right now this room is filled with air. But if we were to run some kind of a hose in here with water and let it run, eventually this room would gradually rise with water and where there was once air, now there would just be water. You know, there's not going to be some kind of weird black hole where you don't have anything. Okay, there's going to be either air or water. And so now the air is being replaced with water. And what I'm trying to say is this. There's been atmospheres in people's lives that need to be replaced. Even though you've, you've broken things off your life, you've, you've rebuked the enemy, and, that's, and by and large, a lot of that's happened. Most people in here can tell a lot of stories about freedom that they've had. And also, there's been a cleansing of defilement. There's been a consecration unto God. But now, there's been a resident like atmosphere in different areas that God is about to shift. How many of you guys would love for God's presence, the atmosphere of heaven, to begin to invade your life in a new way and turn things that were once a certain way, now it just shifts. For example, maybe there's been an atmosphere in some people's physical bodies of infirmity. And it's like there's something there. And all of a sudden, the atmosphere of heaven fills their bodies, and now there's life and health. Amen? An atmosphere, by definition is the air of a location, like the climate. You know, here in the south, we have a certain atmosphere. And there's things that'll grow south of here, like palm trees that won't grow in the north. So there's different atmospheres, different climates. And a lot of people in Christianity, a lot of us, people don't realize that, by and large, the atmosphere of our lives is not the atmosphere of heaven, but it can be. How many feel the presence of God when you come to church and we're worshiping here? Okay, you can feel that at home. You, the atmosphere of heaven can invade your home. It can invade your life. What would it be like where there was maybe an atmosphere, so to speak, and somebody in the soul realm, mentally and emotionally, things have been a certain way, and it seemed like it had been stubborn, but all of a sudden the atmosphere of heaven comes in and things change. Or maybe spiritually their prayer life has been challenging, and it's been pressing through. But now the atmosphere of heaven comes in and it shifts that atmosphere in their life spiritually. Or maybe a home, there had been an atmosphere of that home where it was easy to fight and it was, it was difficult to sleep and it was an oppressed atmosphere that now the atmosphere of heaven comes into that home and man, it's peaceful. The atmosphere is different. There can even be an atmosphere in relationships where things had been a certain way. There was a tendency in marriages that it was a tendency to fight. Maybe they would come into church and the presence of God was so awesome, they would just hug and be happy and hold hands. Everything was great. They'd go home and it would just explode. But there can be an atmosphere, so to speak, in marriages where there's a tendency toward things. But what would happen if the atmosphere of heaven came in and blew that old atmosphere out and now marriages were changed? What I'm trying to say is things can change. When the presence of God comes in, things can change. And I believe that that is the next thing the Lord is about to start doing in River of Life tremendously, is shifting the atmosphere in people's lives. Little Samuel, and I, I know that, that some people say he had to be 30 years old or up. That's not true. I, because I know the priesthood started at 30 and all that, but there was about 10 different things he did wrong to begin with, so I don't think that they were overly concerned with protocol. But I believe Samuel was a little boy. He was not even Levitical. He was from Ephraim. But I believe that, you know, as he was dedicated to God, that little Samuel, Eli, felt in his heart that Samuel had a destiny. And to prepare Samuel for his destiny, Eli allowed this little boy to go lay down in the Holy of Holies by the ark and sleep there at night by the ark. That's in your Bible. Now think about that for a minute. There's about 10 things wrong right there, okay? That, that broke every rule. 
Only the high priest could go in there once a year, right? I mean, there's a lot that's... But Eli felt... and it, See, this shows how God is. God's not legalistic and religious and all that. Good. Eli felt led that that was what was supposed to happen. And so little Samuel would lay there at night, and he would sleep by the ark. And we know the story. It was by the ark that Samuel heard the voice of God and began to prophesy. So Samuel's prophetic ministry actually began as he slept by the ark as a little boy. What I'm trying to get at is this. There's a lot more going on when you're soaking in God's presence than you could ever imagine. The birth of one of God's greatest generals of the Old Testament, Samuel, happened because he slept in the presence of God. He soaked in the glory. The soaking of the glory of God into our lives. So let me say some things I don't normally share, but I feel like it would help people, so I'm going to. This is the preparation that's happening right now in River of Life. There's an atmosphere shift and a soaking that God's wanting to do. Evan Roberts, whenever he was about to see the Great Welsh Revival, at night he would sleep in his bed and he was having these encounters with God where the presence of God was coming on him really strong at night. And he would literally wake up and feel the glory on him. And he would talk to the Lord and pray and go back to sleep in the glory. And that happened frequently. In fact, whenever it was time for him to go off to school, he was really worried about going to school because he didn't want to leave the glory behind. He wanted that to still be happening in his life. And my wife and I at night, before we go to sleep, we always pray together. So here's, here's something that will help. I've taught on the priesthood, the believer, the morning and evening sacrifice, so I'm not going to dwell on that. But I believe in praying before you go to bed. And I always, just me personally, I, I'll take the Lord's Supper and I pray by myself and, and, I, and I apply the blood over our property and just pray over it. And right then, the atmosphere is already shifting, right there. But I go up and, and my wife and I will pray together. And what we do is we speak blessings over one another first. Okay, and I noticed once we started speaking blessings, just that alone was making a difference in our home right there. I don't know if you remember when we started that, but it was, it was noticeable. But we would speak blessings over each other, and then we pray together. And all of this doesn't even take very long, but, but we pray together, and as we do, we believe God that there's going to be an open heaven over our property, and the atmosphere of heaven fill our home, and that we'll soak in the glory of God. Now... We do that every night, for the most part. Sometimes we can't, but I'll still pray. I'm more of a late person. Sometimes my wife doesn't make it. She's, she falls asleep. But anyway, I, I still pray and bless her and all that. But as the priest of the home, that's a responsibility. But here's the thing. This is the honest truth. Most of the time, either in the middle of the night or when I wake up, I feel the glory of God the same way I do here at church in our home. And you would attest to that. Why? Because the atmosphere is shifted. There's no reason why we can't have the atmosphere of heaven in our homes. There's no reason. The only reason would be two reasons. One, people don't believe. Or number two, they're allowing things they shouldn't allow in the home. We'll, we're selective about things that we watch and listen to. We're selective. We're careful. Okay. And we've gone through, we know there's no weird stuff. We don't have little Buddha statues and an African demon mask on the wall or anything like that. We don't have that garbage in our home, okay? We don't have witchcraft stuff. And so the home is clean spiritually, and it's a place where God can come. But I'm going to tell you, taking the Lord's Supper in your home, speaking blessings and praying, making your house a place of prayer, the glory will come. And another thing I do that I like to do is play something revival-based at night. Like a lot of times, well, we, we always have really powerful services here. You know, I mean, I can't think of one that's not, but the atmosphere of heaven's strong. And, in fact, Brianna just told me this, so I'll use her as, as an example. But she said that she went to bed and played a prayer meeting the other day, right? And she said, man, the presence of God was so strong in my home. You know, I like to play stuff on my computer or whatever, just have something playing in the home that, you know, some revival stuff. And just ask God, let that atmosphere come in here. And that's also made a difference as well. I'm sharing all this and being personal like this because I believe that there's a group of people in the sound of my voice that are hungry for God's presence. 
And I believe you're wanting God's presence in your home and in your life. And let me just tell you, you can have it. Don't ever let anybody tell you different. You can have God's presence in your home. And you can have God's presence in your marriage. You can have it as you sleep at night. I love having the glory of God in my room when I'm sleeping at night. In fact, this is probably the first time that we had went to Eureka Springs on a little vacation. And we went into the hotel and I prayed. And remember we talked about, we, we were there three days, that each day the glory of God increased. So the third day, because we'd, we'd pray together, the third day the glory was strong, really strong. But I felt because of the presence of God there in that room, it was strange because I felt like I was at home. So it used to, I didn't like traveling as much. I just, just being away from home, you know. But it felt more like home than it ever had before in a hotel room. But it wasn't the hotel, believe me. It was God. It was his presence. And so if we want his presence, then he will bring his presence into our lives. And that's what I believe right now the Holy Spirit is speaking to me, is that he's wanting to shift atmospheres in people's lives where maybe there's been an atmosphere around you that has been a certain way, but the Lord is wanting the atmosphere of heaven to come in and just blow out and purge out all that old pollution and bring in a new atmosphere that's going to change you. Now, Benny Baker touched on some of these things I recorded when he prophesied over my wife and I, and I was listening back to them, and he was saying that to my wife, he said, God is taking you up to a place where the enemy won't even be able to touch you at all. It's like this, you're going somewhere, and prayer and fasting will be the key. I believe that this presence of God coming in that's about to come in to our ministry in a new way is going to help shift the atmosphere to where people are more in the glory realm. And how many knows the Bible says in Romans 13 that the glory of the Lord, it talked about an armor of light. There's an envelopment of the Spirit of God. There's a glory realm. That's what Adam and Eve lost. And that's what Jesus paid for us to have now, is the glory of God enveloping our lives. But the glory is what will envelop us and protect us from a lot of the spiritual attacks that have been there in the past. 